<laughs> you know, it's uh, it's very pleasurable to be here um, on this uh, cold and dark and rainy night. And I just, as I was listening to that nice introduction, I couldn't help but think, don't, don't you think that Jane Goodall is such a better kisser than Charlton Heston? <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's a lesson there. All right. So um, since uh, many of you uh, evidently have not watched this film, I don't want to give away too many of the important um, uh, plot twists. Um, but I will give away this uh, point, which is that the essential premise of this movie is that if humans devolve, they, didn't, they don't go extinct, but they kind of devolve, whatever that means, um, that other apes would take our place, right? They'd become like us. They'd become bipedal. They'd walk on two legs. They'd get really big brains, which, of course, is very helpful if you have human actors playing these creatures. They'd develop speech and language uh, of the sort that we have today. And they'd have very sophisticated culture of this, uh, like, like modern humans, right? They'd have fancy schmancy clothing. They'd have domesticated animals and plants. They would have all kinds of technology. And fascinatingly, they'd have a class system, right? And in this movie, and again, I'm not giving away too much, so don't worry. This is not a serious plot spoiler. But the gorillas become the police and the military. The orangutans become the administrators and uh, kind of the religious folks. The chimpanzees become the intellectuals and the scientists. And the humans, well, they're just the vermin. That may feel like what the world is like today, but um, but uh, that's the way this movie um, um, thinks about this world, and and and. Um and of course, there's some problems with this logic. But there's one thing that they did get right, right? Which is that apes and humans really are actually very similar because humans actually belong to the ape family. So to get you into the mood and kind of give you a little bit of perspective, I'd like to talk about three questions. The first is, how are we actually related to humans and other apes? How are humans, excuse me, and other apes related? Secondly, if we lost our humanity, would other apes evolve to fill our niche? Would they become like us? That's, the, again, the central premise. And finally, under what kind of circumstances? So first, let's talk about um, are we related, and, or in what way? Now, when this movie was made in 1968, this is how people thought the evolutionary tree of creatures. Well, it was 1968, so I, I, I was, it would have been obvious to put Trump there, but I put Nixon. OK, so everybody thought that gorillas and chimpanzees were most closely related because they're very similar to each other. I'll talk about that in a second. And they had a last common ancestor a pretty long time ago, like 8 million years ago. And then the, the, what, the, what we call the great apes were, again, all formed a, a group. They're all cl more closely related. And our last common ancestor with all the other apes was 25 million years ago. And then we had these other things like gibbons, which are the lesser apes and monkeys. Okay, That's what everybody thought in 1968 when I was four years old. And what we now know clearly, definitively, because of science, Yes, science still exists. <laughs> Evolution did happen. Is that humans turn out to be more closely related to chimpanzees than either of us are to any other species. So uh, Richard Nixon and a chimpanzee share a common last common, la common uh, ancestor, a last common ancestor that lived between about six and eight million years ago, and that we are equally related to gorillas and to orangutans and gibbons and monkeys, and that these dates have changed a little bit. Now, the reason this tree is so interesting is that, as I mentioned before, everybody always assumed that gorillas and chimpanzees were, were more closely related to each other because they're so similar to each other. It turns out that if you actually look at the rules of scaling, so there's a, how many of you have heard of a llama tree? OK, three people raise their hand. All right, allometry is just basically how, things, how size relates to shape and, and, and function. And it turns out that if you were to basically take a chimpanzee and blow it up with a bicycle pump to the size of a gorilla, it would look like a gorilla. Um, gorillas are basically scaled up in large chimpanzees. And that is really fascinating. They, and, they're, and they're similar in all kinds of ways. For example, they both walk in the same peculiar way. They knuckle walk. They, they have these really long arms, so they fold their fingers underneath their, their fists and walk on the middle digit of their, of their, middle, of their knuckles, basically. right? And, um, and what that means is that if gorillas and chimpanzees are so similar to each other, but we're more closely related to chimpanzees, that means that unless all those similarities between between gorillas and chimpanzees evolved independently, which is improbable, that that last common ancestor of gorillas plus chimpanzees and humans was probably a knuckle walker and sort of like a chimpanzee because the gorillas got big. And that, that this creature was also a knuckle walker and like a chimpanzee. Otherwise, all the similarities between the gorillas and chimpanzees would have had to evolve independently, and that's almost completely impossible. 
So here's what probably happened in, in, in the evolution of, of the African apes, right? So eight to 12 million years ago, there was a chimpanzee-like common ancestor, and that, and, and, that, and, that, and that some of these critters ended up in a kind of giant salad bowl, and they got, got selected to be really big, and gorillas, again, are really big chimpanzees, and they eat really low-quality foods. So they basically just got really big, there was very little change along this lineage, and then the chimpanzees really haven't changed very much, and there are actually two species of chimpanzees, bonobos and common chimpanzees, and they're extremely similar to each other. You know, bonobos have more sex, but that's about it. Um, and, then, and then all the really serious change occurred on the human lineage, and there was lots of change along that lineage. So if you went back eight million years ago, the chances are that you would find fairly chimp-like creatures, and that's not also uh, actually all that surprising for all kinds of reasons. Okay, so the question then would, was, is what would happen uh, if and actually when, because it will happen at some point if humans go extinct or, or maybe there's a, some kind of, you know, you know, the postal system will go, go defunct or the, the internet will stop working and we'll, we'll devolve. Okay, so what will happen? <laughs> well, probably the best thing we can say is the apes might not go extinct. Over you know, 1900, there were more than a million chimpanzees, uh, probably. That's based on genetic data. And uh, today, depending upon which, which data, which survey that you look at, there are less than 300,000 chimpanzees left in the rainforest, and that's because of de destruction of their habitats, um, as well as bushmeat trading and various other sorts of things. We are, we are causing the apes to go extinct, so the, their best hope is if we go extinct first. The second um, hypothesis, uh, which is really the premise of this movie, is that they'd evolve to become like us. Now, um, and any uh, of you know the, the, uh, the Jungle Book, right, which I will not sing for you. This is actually a very teleological idea. So the idea is that evolution um, has tried, you know, the, the, the purpose of evolution is to create creatures like us. Right? And that's obviously not how evolution works. We happen to be, um, there, there's no, evolution has no goal, there's no purpose, and certainly humans are obviously uh, um, not, the, not the be all end all of, of evolution. Because that's not how evolution works. So a quick reminder of evolutionary theory, uh, back to high school or college when you first had this. But, but Darwin's great insight about natural selection is based on three essential um, uh, insights. The first is that there's variation, right? I'm looking out at all of you and you all look different, right? There's variation. Some of those differences that make you different from the person sitting next to you and everybody else in this room have a genetic basis. They're heritable. And all of us have differential reproductive success. Some of us have, some of us have more children, some of us have of fewer children, and some of that differential reproductive success is the result of heritable variations. And, and the emergent property of these three things, none of which is controversial, right? All three of them, a creationist would agree with all of these three things, right? That none of them require belief in evolution, but the emergent property of all those three things is that evolution occurs. You get change over time, and from generation to generation, the genetic basis of those populations differs because partly because some of those individuals have genes that that have made them more likely to pass their genes on to the next generation. So the important point is that evolution is a, is, a, is a chance process, right? It's subject to probability, and it's never deterministic. And a good example, again, comes back to the apes, right? For example, the orangutans who live in Asia, right? Uh, we know from the fossil record that there are orangutan-like ancestors at least 12 to 16 million years ago. Here's a, a skull of a modern orang, and here's one of those fossils. You can see they're basically the same thing. They haven't really changed in like 12 to 16 million years. And humans arrived in Asia less than 1.8 million years ago. So that means that in the absence of human beings, the orangs were just happy staying like orangs. They didn't have to become like us. Okay. An even more famous example of teleological thinking is what I show on this slide. Does anybody know uh, what this is? It is. It's the Piltdown Man. This is one of the greatest scientific hoaxes ever. Um, it was discovered this is in a, in a, in a pit, pit in Kent. Um, and this is uh, Charles Dawson and some of his friends. And, and for some reason, there's a, there's a goose there, too. I don't know why. <laughs> Um, it was discovered in 1912, and it was a hoax. It was a forgery. It was actually an orangutan jaw that had been broken up, filed, and made to look old, with a human skull that had been broken up and stained and made to look old. 
and it was buried in a pit in, in, in Kent. And the reason it fooled everybody was that it was exactly what people were looking for, because this had an ape-like jaw and a human-like brain. And of course, what happened in human evolution? What made humans human? Well, it's because we're smart. We have these big brains. And also, obviously, humans evolved in England. Where else could they have evolved, right? <laughs> so uh, it was exactly what people were looking for. And, and by the way, if you're interested in the story, uh, there's incredible, exciting new evidence about who created the Hilt Piltdown forgery. Actually, I would say it's smoking gun evidence. And there'll be a talk in March at the Museum of Natural History by a fellow from University College London, Chris Dean. If you want to come and see that talk, I recommend it. It'll be a really awesome talk. It's very exciting stuff. But I won't give away the whodunit. Finally, under what circumstances would apes evolve to be like humans? Again, the premise of this movie. And we can actually answer this question because it did actually happen once. That's why we're here, right? And so uh, before we start the movie, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the five major transformations that occurred in human evolution that took a, an ape-like common ancestor that we all share um, and transformed it uh, because of a combination of contingent events that were driven by climate change into people like you and me. And by the way, if you, I have to put my daughter through college, so if you want to read this carefully, you, you can um, check out this book I wrote uh, which summarizes all this. Okay, so the first transformation uh, occurred probably around five to eight, maybe six to eight million years ago, and that's the origins of the human lineage, right? They're the first creatures that are more closely related to you and me than they are to chimpanzees. And we call these things hominins. Hominin. They used to call them hominid, but it's for complex reasons we call them hominins. And we actually have some fossils of these things. This is a, a fossil I actually got a chance to work on. It's called Tumai. It's from Chad. It's probably six to seven million years old, and we know, and it has a very chimpanzee-like head, except that its canines are smaller, and it has a neck that points downwards. So we know that when it was walking around, it was walking, when looking where it was going, its neck pointed downwards rather than backwards like a chimpanzee, and that's, that's smoking gun evidence that this was a biped. And we have other material as well, that we have a, a reasonably complete fossil of a creature, critter named Artipithecus, and it has a foot that was clearly that of a biped, it's got a pelvis that was clearly of a biped, but in many other respects, it looks very much like a chimpanzee. This is a, a subject, of course, of much debate, but, um, but Trust me, it looks like a chimpanzee. Um, it's like a bipedal chimpanzee. And the interesting question is why, so, so really it's bipedalism that set our lineage off on a separate evolutionary track than, than the other apes. And we think that one of the reasons for that is that at this time period, Africa was, 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 was drying out. It was the beginning of the Ice Age. Africa, the world as a whole was cooling. Africa was becoming drier. And so a lot of the forest habitats, which apes likes to live in, started becoming more open, like woodland habitats or even savanna habitats. And, and apes Chimps love fruit, right? They have to travel very little to get fruit. In a, in a rainforest in Africa, a chimp will travel maybe two kilometers a day total. That's all they do. They're very sedentary, right? They don't have to go very far every day, but as the forests start dispersing and fruit becomes more far apart in smaller patches, animals would have had to travel farther. And we know, because of experiments that we've actually done, we took retired Hollywood chimpanzees. Here's another Hollywood issue here. We actually convinced them to wear uh, oxygen masks and measured their cost of walking. And it turns out that a chimpanzee spends four times as much energy to be schlep a kilo of its body a meter than a human being does. So by becoming bipedal, so it turns out chimpanzees are very expensive uh, locomotors. They spend a lot of energy uh, traveling. And by becoming bipedal, we, we saved about four times the energy that we would have otherwise spent if we had been like chimpanzees traveling long distances. And that was probably the original reason why we became bipeds. Pretty cool. So after that, it was obviously not such a bad thing, although it made us slow and awkward, but that led to a second transformation, which occurred starting around four million years ago and led to a radiation of species. So there's many of these. There's, you know, I like to torture the students in my class. There are maybe 10 to 12 of these things. There's Australopithecus garhi and Australopithecus robustus and Australopithecus afarensis and Sediba and Anamensis and Baral Gazali. You want to know, know the name is all the Australopiths. The important point is that there's a group of them. There's a radiation, just like there are many mechanics 
blacks and many, you know, many um, gibbons and there's many, all kinds of species come in radiations. Australopiths were no exception. And they're different from these earlier critters because they started getting really big teeth and really big faces and, and they're basically adapted for chewing really crappy food. And then they also became slightly better at walking. So their, their knees became very modern. Their feet lost a lot of the abilities to climb in trees. Um, they evolved very long lumbar columns with a curve in it. And basically, the Australopiths are important because they weaned us off a diet of eating mostly fruit. How many of you ate fruit all day long? See, no chimpanzees in the room. And they also made us better at walking long distances and living in more open habitats. The third transformation started around three million years ago, maybe a little bit less than that. And that's maybe the most exciting transformation in human evolution from my perspective, and that's the origins of the human genus. And lots of things changed. I mean, if you had met an Australopith, you might think, well, maybe that belongs in a zoo, but you would not think about that, about any member of the genus Homo, because they look very much like us, especially from the neck down. They have essentially human-like bodies with long legs and modern feet and very modern pelvises, etc. And they also have uh, brains that started getting bigger and they lost their snouts and they have noses like us and I um, mean they're just incredibly like us in all kinds of ways. They're not exactly like us and what's important about the genus Homo is that they invented the hunting and gathering way of life. And this is a way of extracting a wide range of plant foods. They don't just pick them off you know, trees, they actually dig for their food and collect and extract and, and use, uh, use technology to get their food. They also became carnivores. They started hunting uh, and sometimes scavenging animals. The average uh, hunter-gatherer today walks 9 to 15 kilometers a day, every day. So if you walk 9 kilometers a day, you walk from LA to Washington, D.C. every year. That's what's normal for a hunter-gatherer. They also were carrying things, digging, climbing, throwing. Um, they they also are highly dependent on stone tools and food processing. Uh, we published some, some research on that last year. And finally, that way of life, and we have our evidence in the archaeological record that it involved intense cooperation. So really, the modern way of living um, um, uh, really uh, first appears with the genus Homo and the evolution of hunting and gathering. And once hunting and gathering got, in, got started, it set in motion a kind of positive feedback loop, because hunter and gatherers are able sometimes to do really well to get lots of energy, and that, that enabled them to, uh, to, to, to leave Africa and to go through another radiation, which is a group of critters called the archaic humans. Neanderthals are one of them, Homo heidelbergensis is another, the Denisovans, some of you have heard of them. There's a whole group of these critters. And these have, are like Homo erectus, uh, or like us from the neck down, but they also started getting really big brains. <laughs> And what the, the, the archaic humans are really about are better hunter-gatherers who, are, who, are, who are better able to get more energy, right? And they're doing that by, by not just by hunting and gathering well, but they have now more sophisticated tools than we find earlier on. They invented cooking, which, which, uh, which first appears, it's a little bit of a debate, but some, sometime between, well, the oldest evidence for cooking is about 500,000 years old. Could be a million if you stretch it a little bit. They changed their life history. So chimpanzees, for example, and, and Homo erectus has, have um, grew up sort of fast, but these, these critters grew up much more slowly. Instead of having babies every six years, they were able to pump them out twice as fast, about every three years. Uh, so, and all of that requires a lot more energy. And then the final transformation, the, the one that uh, led to us, of course, uh, the origins of modern humans, happened around 200 to 300,000 years ago. And really, we're no different from uh, those other, other archaic humans from the neck down, really. There's some very, very, very subtle differences. The big difference about us is that our, we have a much more rounded head and we have a small retracted face. And it looks like uh, what made humans the way we are is that, um, is that we have some shifts in our, perhaps in our, in our brains. Um, so we have a more, maybe a reorganized brain. There's evidence for certain structures being relatively larger. We also have a, a, a shifts in in the, in, the, in the way in which our faces grow and function that help us have more articulate speech by having this short retracted face that improves our ability to produce um, um, a speech. And of course, that helps us have culture, right? And, and along with the origins of human beings comes a rapid acceleration of cultural evolution. So we go from, from simple stone tools all the way up to much more sophisticated uh, weapons and tools, uh, and we're still inventing them uh, day by day and week by week. But 
One thing you should remember, and I think it's an important point that this movie kind of makes actually, is that we haven't stopped evolving. Natural selection is still going on, except now there's two kinds of evolution, right? There's not only biological evolution occurring through natural selection, as I discussed before, but there's also cultural evolution that's going on at the same time. And cultural evolution is a faster, more powerful, more potent process, but they're interacting. Cultural evolution affects natural selection, and natural selection affects cultural evolution. And the end result is, well, we don't know what's happening yet. We don't know where we're going at this point. We can, we can measure it. There's even studies here in the Boston area. Some of you may know that in Framingham, Massachusetts, there are still ongoing studies that are actually trying to measure natural selection that's going on in the town of Framingham. Uh, it's a long-term long study that's been going on uh, for three generations. So we're still evolving um, and in all kinds of complex ways, primarily through cultural evolution, but also through biological evolution. And, uh, well, the, the, the next chapter of human evolution has yet to be written. So before we start the movie, I just want to point out that like all species go extinct and humans are no exception. We will probably go extinct. Um, and, um, and hopefully when we go extinct, there'll still be some great apes. But I think we need to ask the question, do we really want them to become like us? Uh, are we really, uh, are we really what uh, a good species for our planet? Well, that's another that's another question, and I think and I think it's really up to Hollywood to try to answer that one. <laughs> so I uh, hope you enjoy the film.